Hello everyone, today we're going to be going over the June 2025 Life Science Biology Regents exam. In this video we're going to be covering the 8th cluster of questions, which covers questions 38 through 42. We're going to go ahead and start off with number 38, which calls to this passage in this graph. The passage is titled, is titled Keystone Species, Black-Tailed Prairie Dogs, and it reads, The black-tailed prairie dog is a keystone species because it maintains the complex web of relationships in North America's central grassland ecosystems. They feed primarily on plants that are high in moisture and nutrients. As they eat the plants, they drop leaf clippings which add nutrients to the soil. They construct burrows which, when abandoned, can provide homes to rattlesnakes, burrowing owls, and insects. Prairie dogs are the primary prey for many organisms, including the black-footed ferret, one of the rarest and most endangered animals in North America. The prairie dog population of North America's central grassland is on a steady decline. The most significant threats facing prairie dogs are the conversion of rangeland to cropland, urban development, hunting, and the use of poison because they are considered a pest to local farmers and ranchers. The graph below shows some data in, stu in a study of 17 prairie dog colonies in Nebraska. <coughs> So we're told that prairie dogs are a keystone species, so they're required or they're, you know, vital to maintaining the balance of an ecosystem. Uh, predator and prey both rely on their population, right? They provide uh, prairie dog burrows, provide habitat for predators, and prairie dogs themselves provide food um, for predators, obviously, because they predate on them. And prairie dogs also, as they eat plants, they drop leaves on the ground, which then fertilize more plant growth. And over here, we see a graph that shows the changes in the average number of prairie dog burrows and burrowing owl populations in North America. So we understand that even though it doesn't show it in the graph here, we know that the prairie dog population is on a continual uh, decline, right? So we can assume that um, from 1990 to 1996, the number of prairie dogs is also decreasing. And as a result, the number of owls is also decreasing. We started with, you know, somewhere around 90 owls in the year 1990, um, and now we're only left with about 39 or 38 owls uh, at the end of that. And we also see that the number of abandoned burrows significantly decreases over time. Uh, over here, we had about, you know, 5.5 burrows per a given area, and now we only have about 1.5. So there's a dramatic decrease in the number of burrows as well, which, well, why should be, why will there be a decrease in the number of burrows? Well, because the prairie dog population is decreasing and they're no longer digging enough burrows. So number 38 asks, how did the number of prairie dog burrows affect the carrying capacity of burrowing owls in the area? Well, remember that burrowing owls, the whole reason why they're called burrowing owls is because they live in burrows uh, dug by prairie dogs. And as the prairie dog population decreased, the number of burrows um, that were available for these owls to move into also decreased. So carrying capacity is just the total amount of species that an environment can host. And what determines carrying capacity is usually space, right? Um, you can only have, you know, 100 owls in this area because there's not enough space for more owls or there's not enough food for, mo uh, for those arrow owls. In this case, it's space that's a carrying that's limiting the carrying capacity, right? Because where will the owls live? The owls need to live in a burrow. If there's not enough burrows, then not enough owls, then the owl population will decrease, right? The environment won't be able to support a large number of owls because they won't have a place to live and a habitat is a prerequisite to a growing population, okay? So the answer choice I'm looking for is that as the number of prairie burrows decrease, the number of burrowing owls also decrease. So it's not choice one. Um, as the number of burrowing owls increased, the number of prairie dogs in the area could support decreased. That's false. We're looking for a relationship between prairie dog burrows and burrowing owls, okay? Choice three says, as the number of prairie dog burrows decreased, the number of burrowing owls the area could support also decreased. That's what I'm looking for, right? As literally, as the number of houses decreased, the number of people that can live in that area also decreases because there's not enough houses. So think about that in terms of um, carrying capacity, right? As the number of um, prairie dog burrows decreased, the number of owls that the environment could support decreased because there's not enough space for them. Number 39 says, uh, evaluate the claim that a significant decrease in the prairie dog population would have widespread effects by identifying a specific interaction between e um, ecosystem components. So when we're asked to evaluate a claim, we're either saying that it's valid, meaning that you know it's, good, it's a good claim, you can support it, or that it's not valid. Okay, so in this case, the claim here is that a significant decrease in prairie dog population would have widespread effects. So is that true? Well, yeah, prairie dogs are vital to maintaining a balance in the ecosystem. So we can say that, yes, the claim is valid. 
Prairie dogs are a keystone species. Their removal or a decrease in their population would have a wide would have widespread environmental impacts. Or it would have widespread impacts for their ecosystem. Okay, so that's the first part of the question. You identified what part of that claim you agree with, or what part was valid. Um, uh, a decrease in population would have widespread impacts on their ecosystem. Now. To get full credit, we need to describe a specific interaction between ecosystem components. So yeah, the prairie dog population, if it decreases, other animals will be hurt. Well, why? Well, well, let's look at a reason, right? Number one, um, this black-footed ferret, uh, the black-footed ferret preys on prairie dogs, right? Prairie dogs are the primary prey for organisms, including the black-footed ferret. So we can just say here that a decrease in the prairie dogs would have a significant impact because the black-footed ferret, they're the primary food source of the black-footed uh, ferret, right? Um, so we can just say that they would have widespread impacts on their ecosystem as uh, prairie dogs are the primary source of food for the endangered All right so all i said is yeah the claim is valid prey dogs are a keystone species and their removal uh, would or a decrease in their population would have widespread impacts on their ecosystem as prairie dogs are the primary source of food for endangered black-footed ferrets, okay? So obviously it's implied that a decrease in their population would further endanger uh, the black-footed ferret. Again, you could have also said that, um, yeah, it's valid because prairie dogs provide habitats for owls. Okay, so as long as you just described how the prairie dog interacts or helps to support this ecosystem, you would have gotten full credit here, okay? All right, so the questions continue. It says that a disease known as the sylvatic plague is caused by a bacterium that is carried by fleas on rats. The disease targets small mammals, including the prairie dog. The disease entered the western United States as a consequence of the shipping industry and has been spreading eastward. The graph below shows changes in the prairie dog population observed in two different, pop in two different states since the 1990s. Okay, so in South Dakota, we see that there is no plague there. There aren't impacted, and as a result, the population doesn't really change that much, right? The population does fluctuate, and you should expect that in ecology, right? Just if a po Populations always have uh, cycles of up and down in a given environment because they'll you know, they'll reach the carrying capacity and then they'll have to decrease. But the key thing to look at is that it's stabilized around a certain number. So we can see that, you know, on average, this population is pretty close to, you know, 95% um, percent capacity. Okay. Now, in the in Colorado, where the plague is present, we see the opposite, right? Um, when the plague was introduced to the environment, uh, we see a dramatic decrease in the population of these prairie dogs, pretty much to like under 10% of them surviving. And then we can see this giant fluctuation and then a slow recovery. Okay. So number 40 says a claim was made that some of the prairie dogs in Colorado had an advantageous heritable trait that protected them from the plague, which statement would provide evidence to support this claim. So if you have an advantageous trait, that means that you're able to survive better. So what part of this graph would help us um, prove that point? Well, number one, it would have to be the Colorado uh, line, because if we look at the South Dakota line, uh, they have no plague. So there would be no pressure that forces them to make that adaptation. Okay, so what the problem is saying is that some of the prairie dogs have ha got a mutation or somehow acquired a trait that makes them immune to this disease, right? And generally, when you're immune to a disease, you're better at surviving, so you can pass on your genes. So the fact that the population kind of rebounded after year two is proof of that, right? It, they were all dying, 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 dying. All of a sudden, someone developed that immunity. As a result, everyone without the immunity died out. The person with immunity did not. He was able to reproduce more successfully. His kids were immune. 
his kids that were immune were able to reproduce more successfully again. Um, so this is definitely supporting that immunity, okay, because there's a rebound in the population, okay? Again, there's a decrease here, but we can see the same thing, right? Um, sharp decline in the population, all of a sudden someone develops immunity, and then they begin reproducing, all of their kids have immunity, and the population stabilizes again, okay? Um, so choice one does not support that, right? The prairie dog population increased between years one and two. It did not, it decreased between years one and two. It went from 100 down to zero. Choice two, the prairie dog population declined between one years one and two and seven and eight. So far, that's true. But was able to recover because prairie dogs with the product, protective variations survived to reproduce. That's why choice two is the correct answer, right? That's pretty much what I said. It identified a trend correctly. There was a decrease, not an increase between years one and two and seven and eight. And the reason why the population was able to rebound is because if you if you're an, if you have a immunity to a disease, well then you're able to pass on those immune traits, okay? Uh, choice three is false. The number of surviving prairie dogs was never above 60%. Okay, it was above 60% for about a year and then for how, however long this peak lasted for, okay? Um, overall, the trend is that it's below 60%, and both populations did not recover from the plague because South Dakota never had the plague, okay? So that's why choice four is wrong. 41 says the South Dakota prairie dog population shows fluctuation within a range. Which row of the table identifies how different factors affect carrying capacity, okay? And again, remember, carrying capacity is that, you know, uh, size limit for a specific population, right? So this row or this column says factors keeping population from dropping substantially okay so, so if something drops substantially it decreases a lot that's that's the translation here um and if you're keeping something from doing that it means you're preventing it okay so here belong factors that stop the population from dropping off a lot okay now let's just look at this right would urban development stop the population from decreasing no right it would if anything it would increase uh it would it would help the population decrease because urban development urban is describing like city-like environments so if all of a sudden you had this large plat uh or plot of beautiful you know grassland that the prairie dogs love to live in and all of a sudden you say hey i want to make a city here you begin paving over it, you make roads you make a city layout and you start making skyscrapers guess what that urbanization that creation of an urban space with all these skyscrapers and buildings have now taken away land from the, that the prairie dogs need to live in and as a result, that would decrease their population, right? That would decrease the carrying capacity because it's limiting the, the space. So choice one is wrong. Two, the depletion of soil nutrients. Again, if, if you have this plot of land, right, this grass needs nutrients um, to grow. And why? Because the prairie dogs need to eat the grass. So if nutrients are depleted, remember depleted means gone. So if all the nutrients in the soil are gone, that means that all of the grass will die out. If all the grass dies out, then the prairie dogs won't have enough food to eat and they'll also begin to die out. So that's not a factor that keeps them, that keeps the population from dropping a lot. Okay. Uh, three, the preservation of grasslands. Okay. If all of a sudden we start to preserve this land, we're like, Hey, don't make your roads and your ugly buildings here, preserve this land. Well, yeah, that means that the population would be protected. So this choice three is a possible correct answer. And choice four, a decreased use of poisons would also be a possible correct answer because if you poison this land, the prairie dogs are obviously going to get poisoned and they're going to die. So choice three and four so far look like the correct choices because they have this factor correctly identified. Now we have to look at the second column. It says factor keeping the population from increasing substantially. So we just identified two factors that stop them from going extinct, right? Stop their populations from sky uh, from crashing. Now we need to look at a factor that um, keeps their population from skyrocketing, okay? And predation by ferrets is going to be the correct answer, right? So technically, we reserve this plot of land for the prairie dogs to live in. Now they have space to survive. But because they are predated, right? Because they're a source of food for ferrets, the ferrets eat the prairie dogs and make sure that their populations don't skyrocket, okay? If you increase the soil nutrients, that means that there would be more grass and that the prairie dog population would continue to increase. In this case, you want something to limit that growth, which would usually be a predator, okay? Uh, last question in this section says, various methods of controlling this plague have been or are being investigated, two methods that have been found effective are described in the table below. So we can give the prairie dogs a vaccination. Um, it's an oral vaccination given as a peanut butter flavored tablet. It fights off the infection for up to nine months after becoming active and tablets must be eaten by the prairie dogs within seven days of being dropped, okay? And then we have burrow dusting. 
which is when insecticide powder is sprayed into prairie dog burrows. It kills the fleas that carry the disease that is transmitted to prairie dogs, and it can reduce fleas for up to two years beginning immediately after spraying. Uh, and they say that the location of the study is near residential areas and open ranges they are used to um, that are used to graze cattle and serve as habitats for wild animals. Researchers have been asked to make recommendations regarding the strategy or which strategy would be best to use to protect prairie dog populations from the plague without negatively impacting nearby areas. All right, and what the question wants us to do is to describe a treatment, vaccination or burrow dusting, that will best protect prairie dogs from the plague while considering the criteria... Um, and constraint of cost, safety, or reliability. Use specific information from the table to justify your choice of cost, safety, or liability. So essentially we have two solutions here. Which one do you want to choose? The key thing is that there's no right or wrong answer, right? Um, <clears throat> both are effective ways. You just need to highlight why. You just need to make a choice. So you can say that vaccination is an effective impact because um, the prairie dog, because it actually fights off the infection. Um, and is specific to the prairie dogs, right? Also, using a vaccination means that the insecticide won't um, spread or that the, uh, yeah, the insecticide powder won't spread to nearby areas that are populated by cattle, right? So that's, a, that's one way of justifying it. You could have also said that burrow dusting is an effective way of um, treating it because it provides longer protection, right? It reduces fleas for up to two years, whereas this reduces the infection for nine months. Um, and because burrow dusting doesn't expire after seven days, right? You don't, once you uh, dust a burrow, um, that means that you don't have to do it again uh, because the tablets expire, whereas the insecticide doesn't, okay? You could also say that uh, because the burrow dusting is specific to burrows, um, the cattle, the nearby cattle won't be affected as the nearby cattle could like accidentally eat these oral vaccinations or these um, these tablets on the ground, right? So my point here is that there is no one answer for this, right? As long as you talked about the reliability, AKA, oh, um, is it the best treatment? Will it last the longest? Or the safety, will this treatment uh, be eaten by other wild animals? Or will this treatment, you know, uh, impact the humans uh, or the cattle nearby? Or if you just said, oh, this treatment will cost the least or cost the most, you would have gotten full credit here, okay? And I gave you two answers for that. I just don't, don't want to write it down because there's no point, okay? So that's the end of this section. If you have any questions, please let me know.